This episode is sponsored by Lupton Capital, which provides a variety of investment services to both retail and institutional investors on platforms such as Seeking Alpha, Substack, and StockTwits. For more information on these services or for links to those services, please visit luptoncapital.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Investing with the Whales podcast. Super excited for our next guest today. It is Jim Ropel. A lot of you guys know him from Twitter. Uh, Jim is another can slam guy. Uh, I've been very successful in his trading over the last 30 plus years. I think he said he started in, in 85. So he's got some good stories for us. So Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so talk to us about, you said you started in 85, right? I did. I'm trading out of my dorm room. Oh, really? <laughs> Dude, I was using a service called CompuServe, which was to download, which was a division of Sears. Wow. So $6 a minute to download option one page of options cost me six dollars to download the page and by the time it finally downloaded it was stale <laughs> that's how i started i mean how many i mean back then how many companies did even had even options on them that you could trade um i was so in the dark that i barely understood anything <laughs> i mean there you know like there was monthly options and that was it um you know there was probably like 10 strikes up and down monthly only. That's all it was. I mean, this is a long time ago. <laughs> but they always say, if you're going to learn to trade, start early and start small, right? Better to learn your, you know, take your bumps and bruises with a small amount of money versus these people that, you know, they work their entire career, they retire and they're like, oh, okay, I'm going to go run my own money for the first time. And they have no idea what they're doing. I think that that is so destructive to, and unfortunately, the smarter someone is, the more likely they're going to have a giant ego and, you know, they can bury themselves. You can, you can be a plastic surgeon for your, you know, or a brain surgeon or a rocket scientist, retire at 60 with two, three, four, five million bucks and blow it down to 500,000 in two years. I mean, that, that, that happens. Oh, for sure. No doubt. Um, so what sort of strategy do you run? And I know you run more than one portfolio, right? So you probably run a couple of different strategies. I have two equity funds. One is big cap and one is small cap. Okay. Uh, the problem was shortly after I started the small cap fund, we got into a bear market and ideas kind of um, became very thin. So I told my uh, portfolio manager who runs it for me, just buy anything you want. And it's just kind of continued like that. And uh, then I have a crypto fund. And uh, so I, the two fu equity funds are can slim 100%. Okay. And what and does can slam mean? Just for anyone that's not familiar with that acronym. Current earnings, annual earnings, new highs, new products, S, shares outstanding, leader laggard, I, institutional sponsorship. And uh, I think you got all of them. M is general market trend. Okay. But it's I'm a knockoff of Bill O'Neill. I, I think the Japanese had it right. Why invent anything? There's already been someone who's probably done what you want to do, written a book about it, and they've been very successful. If Bill was a billionaire and I do half as well, I'll probably just get by <laughs> that 500 mil. Good, good theory. Um, does CanSlim work on small caps the same way it works on large caps? It does, but I prefer the liquidity, right? A larger cap stock because when you have small caps have nearly no institutional sponsorship, which causes them to have be wide, uh, greatly more vi uh, volatile. And the average true range of the day is much higher. Right. And I don't want to get rattled all over the place. And the, and the bid ask, I mean, I'm trying to trade some small caps right now. And the bid ask is just ridiculous sometimes, really frustrating. Yeah. I mean, I'm running, you know, hundreds of millions. So I, I'm, that's, I'm precluded. I, right. I just can't do that. I take you know, I put my opening position is 10% of equity. Wow. Okay. So I need, I don't ever want to be more than 5% of average daily dollar volume. So I'm pretty much locked into the top 150 market cap stocks. Okay. Now, sometimes I'll see something like for me, if I got out of Celsius right now, the market would know it. I mean, <laughs> Please don't get out then. <laughs> no, I mean, it, you know, temporarily. And I, I'm just saying liquidity at this minute th because of the bear market has dried up to a large extent. I mean, three, six months ago, liquidity was a lot thinner. We're starting to get a little improvement there, but uh, can slim is phenomenal. If you have a half a million, 100,000, 5 million, 10 million, 
you get up to 100 million and liquidity is an issue. You know, size kills performance. It's like an Olympic athlete with giant cinder blocks on his ankles. You're, you're restricted. Like the average guy out there who has, you know, let's call it less than a couple million dollars or less than a million can put an order in, trade at the market, buy a thousand or two thousand and put a stop in. I cannot put, I have to watch those. And when I sell, I'll sell 15%. If it goes down, I'll sell a little bit more. I mean, I'm working in and out. I can't just go market by my position. Okay. Smaller accounts have an enormous advantage over instant. I'm a minor institution, very small. I mean, it's the same thing when you see these hedge funds that have five, 10 billions of dollars, you know, five, 10 billion under management, and their performance is a lot worse than it was when they were a $500 million fund. It's just, it's a lot harder to run that much more money, right? Your universe starts to really shrink down. Getting in and out of positions is harder. You really have to almost go global macro. You're in the futures market. You're you can't let me slow down. If you have a $30 billion equity fund, you're buying with a view of three years forward and you're in there buying stock. Say you want to buy Celsius, you're buying every single day, hundred thousand shares for a month. Wow. And that's what I'm looking for. I want to get I want to position in front of those tidal waves. I mean, I'm very basic. I really am. I'm just trying to identify institutional accumulation in the beginning of a new bull market, just like we're in, right? Probably we're in a transition from possibly a bear to a bull after a horrific growth bear with augmented with the turbocharger of AI. There's a housing boom and there's a reshoring, nearshoring institutional warehousing boom occur. I mean, a boom. So, there, and then we've got a Fed about to go on hold. So this giant wave looks like it's it's building, and I'm just trying to get in front of it. What are some other names besides Celsius? And you know that I'm a big Celsius bull. I've been in the stock for for a few years now. What That's are some? Other- <laughs> Love it. Um, I usually drink two or three a day, so I'm pretty jacked up. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, this is a, this is a job that requires a lot of uh, a lot of energy. So and and focus, discipline. Um, what are some other companies that are on your on your radar right now, or maybe even in your portfolio, if you're allowed to talk about individual names, where you see that institutional accumulation, um, earning acceleration, revenue acceleration, analysts raising their estimates, all the things I know you look for, all the things that Celsius possesses. Uh, I mean, I know the Celsius numbers inside and out, and right now their their Nielsen data uh, for the last two weeks coming into July was 153% year over year. That's US US retail sales. I mean, that's just mind boggling. Like Monster is a $60 billion company and Monster never came anywhere close to what Celsius is doing right now. So they're in like a a league of their own. But what are other companies that are getting you excited right now? You want me to share my screen? Yeah. All right. So uh, you have to enable me. Mm. And I'll just, I'll tell you, it's the name is my biggest position is NVIDIA. It should okay. be no shock to anyone. It is the single leading stock in the whole market. You should be able to share now. Okay. Yeah, when NVIDIA is a beast. That's, that's one stock I missed this year. It's killing me. But I am in, I am, uh, I'm in super micro. Oh, so am I. Good. Um, we're buddies. I hope you bought today too on the dip. Did you, I didn't. I've been building for a while, but okay. let's look at NVIDIA. First of all, they have a bit of an earnings slump down here. You can see in the line, I'm putting the arrow on. But last quarter in the lower left, they beat by 18.5%. Their after-tax margin is 37.7%. This is the institutional block. Fidelity is all over this, okay? And you have the added luxury of prime cap odyssey being in there. These aren't just institutions. They're leading institutions. They're winning. They're winners. If you go up here, I don't know if you follow up to down volume, it's 1.2. It's the third best group out of 200. The estimates for this year are only for 136% growth. I don't know if that's appealing to you. Estimates are for 40% next year. And I'm going to suggest that those numbers are going to be light. The odd, the odd, this is going to be a beat and raise, multiple beat and raise quarter type situation. If I flip to the weekly, because when, when they reported Q1 numbers, they raised their Q, Q2 revenue guidance from $7 billion to $11 billion. I mean, you don't do that unless you know you have $11 billion in the bag. Okay. That is the type of revenue beat that you would expect out of a small cap 
Right. And you're looking right. at a one point one billion dollar company. I mean, the law of large numbers has not caught up with these guys. They don't. They can't hear that. Um, but talking about institutions, if you look in the lower left where I'm showing you, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine weeks in a row up here. Wall of blue institutional accumulation, and the the height of these bars are like you know skyscrapers amongst one story homes. Now, if you look at the when this when it was coming down in the bear market, it was all dominated by sellers. Look at the, right. these are, these are skyscrapers of selling. Yep, we've had a tectonic shift. The relative strength is ninety nine, so it's outperforming ninety nine percent of all other companies. A accumulation distribution. Now it's wildly extended, wildly. But what people don't really get is that in a bull market, a new bull market, your true leader can go up 500, 1,000, even like, I think Ascent Communication went up over 2,000% in 95 weeks. Wow. And that's common. It, what people don't get right now is the significance of this opportunity. First of all, we're probably in the last bull or maybe the second to last bull in a secular bull market. So this is after a bear market of major significance augmented by AI, an opportunity like this may not come along. Like I'm already almost 60. After one or two more big bull runs, we may get into a secular bull market. So this is really maybe one of the last monster opportunities in this cyclical bear or secular bear. A bull, I'm sorry. And uh, I think that these new names that are coming out. In the, and well, let, let's look at your Celsius. Do you, do you think the markets are efficient? I do. Very so why why did Nvidia and Meta why did they get so oversold? I mean, I guess Nvidia is like an AI thing, and maybe people didn't appreciate AI until Chat GPT and then Q1 earnings. But you know, some of these stocks got at Netflix, right? I mean, last year got absolutely destroyed. You know, Bill Ackman basically liquidated his position at the lows, and now these three stocks are up probably an average of two hundred percent from the lows last year. Like. Is that efficient? <laughs> well, let me ask you, I'm going to ask you a question. Say you're a geneticist and you're working in a lab and you have identified um, a, a, a formulation to cure some type of cancer. Now, you know it and the stock is public, but the stock is languishing. Does it matter that you know that? It doesn't matter. No. It's irrelevant. Until the market recognizes what you think you know the news is worth nothing. Price is everything. So if you look at um, PLTR, it was trading at five. Right. They invested billions and billions in AI five, seven years ago. So what they had right here was the same as it is right here. But the market didn't accept it, didn't want to know it, or didn't care. But all of a sudden, these walls of blue institutional massive demand was when the geneticist novel cure for cancer was discovered or embraced by the market. And it almost feels like NVIDIA opened, like un unleashed a lot of this. It did. You know, when NVIDIA ra raised their guidance, everyone's like, holy shit, this AI thing is actually real. NVIDIA is going to crush it. Now who's, who's next? You know, what are the other stocks that we can play? Well, we were on vacation with my family and my daughter brought her boyfriend and we were in Aspen in a crystal snow, you know, early uh, snow season, very early in December, I think. And he goes, check out this chat GPT thing. And I was like, wow, this is what all the talk is. One million people adopted that in four days. And that was like the kickoff. AI has been around since 1960. Oh, yeah. In right. crude forms. But now the eyes have been opened to the possibilities. There was a report I read a month or two ago that said AI is going to add, I think, 15.7 or 17.5 trillion dollars to gro global GDP in the next seven years. Wow. Just staggering. Now, again, and the video is going to be right in the middle of it. <laughs> they're the bedrock. <laughs> and you also have Jensen Yang who is a leader among leaders. There's, there's brilliant people, and then there's truly genius. When you have a Elon Musk or a Jensen Yang or you know, a, 
Oh my God. You know, those, uh, those, those two really do sit at the top of the list though. They do. Alex Carp at Palantir. These people are, look, you could have a greatest product in the world. And if you have a moron running the company, it may never get to market or they may bungle the whole thing. Excellence matters. I, another stock I did pretty well in many years ago was JDS Uniphase. They had, I think, I think I, I may overstate this, but 270 PhDs on staff. Okay. Management really matters. Um, and there's, you know, something about crypto that really disturbed me was there were so many new pro projects launching. I'm like, there's not that much talent to run these. Pr there's, there, there's, there was not enough great management. Right. I know you a mean, lot of that yeah. was children writing white papers who were pretty smart, but they, they were so young. They had no clue how to start a company. I mean, I knew it wasn't going to work. They were, I knew most of them were going to fail. Right. There was too many of these altcoins rather than like the best cryptos, you know, getting the best people to work on them. 100%. Can I run you through your, uh, oh, well, this is panel. I want to talk to you about Celsius. Yeah. Yeah. Please. This is your name. And so I, I, have a, I, I have a, a mini cooler. Well, it's like three feet high next to my desk full of all my favorite flavors. So <laughs> that, that's how much of an addict I am. Well, so you had fundamental knowledge because you were drinking it. But until those institutions believe your story, and here are this, this skyscraper of blue accumulation right off the bottom, where it makes a new low and it closes the week almost at the high, major signal. Then you have a couple more monster blue bars that's running up here and then more right here. Oh, shoot. And I was, I was going into stores and talking to managers about how it was selling compared to Monster and Red Bull. These guys, total addressable market is Monster's market. It yep. literally oh, is. Sure. Yep. Okay. And so you have estimates for 158% growth this year, followed up by 50% next year, up to down volumes 1.7. Uh, now, they, the big thing for me was this distribution agreement with PepsiCo. Yep. And that is a game changer. Distribution agreements. Stock, then, stock has basically doubled since then, too. Like the, mar the market reason. finally learned to appreciate it. I mean, shelf space, marketing power is just, it's like your forearms. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, like you said, it, you could have the best product, but if you don't have distribution, it doesn't matter. I mean, if no one knows about it, how are you going to sell it? So this is another great. Now, look, it reversed. It had a, you know, the market got really heated up. The NASDAQ was 9% over the 50-day. The prior pullback occurred at 10% over the 50-day. Things were sticking straight up in there. Now, this pulled it back two day, three days ago. Yeah, it's funny because it, it just it hit an all-time high a few days ago and then did a quick pullback from there. Right. We're about 9% off the high. It's sitting right at the 50 day. You know, we'll see, but this is no, this is just fine. Absolutely just fine. The store, listen, if you don't understand the fundamentals, you're going to get shaken out. Cause if you don't believe intimately, every stock that I've had a life changer in, I understood the fundamentals intimately and the trend of the security agreed with my position. We were aligned. If you have a position mentally, a fundamental story that you believe that is not corroborated by the direction of the general market and the stock or commodity you're discussing, you're pissing in the wind. You're going to lose. <laughs> you have to have those two in alignment. So what, what is your favorite time to start buying a stock? And I know for you, it's a little bit different because you run more money. You have to build bigger positions. But is it a, a stock with great fundamentals that's pulling back to the 21-day or the 50-day? Is this stock after it gaps up on earnings, a stock after it breaks out through a previous pivot? Like where, where do you start to salivate? I kind of demand a prior uptrend. Okay. So I have to, a prior uptrend of significance. And like I bought, I, in my Baidu trade, I think it went from 19 to about 120 where I established my position. I started right there. Wow. Earnings, and it, it, it went crazy from there. Um, I gap ups on earnings are a major, major signal prior to, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. When I started in the business, an analyst could go say, you're CEO of Lupton. I come in and I say, whatever your product is, how you doing? 
Jonah tells me, I write a report, disseminate it to my sales staff. They call other institutions and they bid it up slowly over days and weeks. Now there's Reg FD. Reg FD precludes the dissemination of material information unless it's generally announced to the public all at once. So there's silence from management between quarters. And then they have these giant surprises where there's new information. And now the market's got to adjust to the new news and the stock's got to up or down um, adjust. The definition of a true market leader, if you can position at the beginning of a bull market in a stock that's about to have four to six beat and raise quarters, you're going to change your life. If you have a position of 10 to 15 to 20% of your account in that idea, okay? That's what I'm trying to do. I, I don't care about five or 10% up. That's to me, that's I, it's a waste of my time. I would rather lose 2% than take a 5% profit. I, I just, I don't care. Now, that also causes me to have erratic results. All right. I've made my whole net worth in probably like eight stocks. And I'm <laughs> doing, I'm not kidding. And half of them were bought on earnings gaps up. Like I bought SanDisk one time. I think it gapped up like 25% in one day. I started buying it at the high and it just went to Mars. And just, I mean, I, I like buying earning gap ups too, because it's the start of accumulation. The analysts will all start to upgrade the stock, raise their price targets. Like there's a lot of reasons why you should not be scared to chase the gap up. Um, why, why else do you like it? I mean, so well, I like it because that's the beginning of the cockroach theory. When I took my kids to college, we, you know, I, I'm, that's not true. Let's say you take your kid to college and you walk in this place that's a little rickety and there's a cockroach that comes out from the counter. Well, guarantee you there's 10 more under the, under the, you can't see them. <laughs> Earnings beats are, you get serial gappers. So when you have one, there's probably going to be more. It's not, you don't have a explosion in sales and earnings that just goes away. Like a couple that come to mind, like SMCI has been gapping up for the last year. Elf Cosmetics seems like it gaps up almost on every earnings. And I keep thinking like, I'm, I'm not going to chase it. I'm not going to chase it. And three months later, it gaps up again. Three months later, it gaps up again. Like you're right. I mean, the, the ones that beat and raise and gap up, they don't, it's not usually just one. People don't understand what is possible. Most people have never made money in the market. So when they make enough to buy a car or to buy a house, they're like, I, I, they, they take it. And right now we're in one of those moments where stocks are starting to go up 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%, and they're, they're going to take it. We've been in this growth bull market for about 15 weeks. Remember, ONON blew up almost for no reason about 15 weeks ago. AXON blew up. The growth bull market had not started then. It's just started. And true market leaders, like I, I mean, they're commonly going to go up 300 to 1,000%. So people are going to screw this up. Like they're they not going to sit. Like 2020. I mean, there's a lot of stocks that went up 200, 300% in 2020. And, and they were, the concepts of what they were doing, stay at home stocks was very easy to understand, but people don't understand what's possible and how common, if you're in the leaders, like you mentioned, SMCI. AI demands massive processing power. They have a bolt-on solution that is, they have three new products coming out later this year. There's been a lot of test orders given for those. They have, they were 100% in the US manufacturing two and a half years ago. They moved half to Malaysia, which is 70% cheaper, and the other half to Taiwan, which is 50% cheaper. So their automatically margins are going to go up wildly. On top of the fact that their scalable product uses 30% less energy. So it's kind of got that green twist. And it's people, the product's in such high demand because the infrastructure to support AI has got to be built. This is bedrock. This is like Jensen Wong talked about like hundreds of billions of dollars of CapEx that has to be invested in order to keep up with the demand that AI is going to require. If AI is going to work, the infrastructure has got to be built first. Yep. So this is this is bricks and mortar. Now, this, this is my opinion, but the stock tells me I'm corroborating it with the trend. 
And they they pre-announced earnings today and raised their EPS guidance for fiscal year 2023 Q4, raised the low end by 50%. So, <laughs> I mean, if that's interesting to you, I, I you know, <laughs> you've well, got to sit with these things and you've got to have cushion. If you don't have cushion, there's, you can't sit through days like today. So your eight biggest winners, how long do you think you held? Like what was the average hold time for those eight biggest winners? Initially, they were usually around nine months. Okay. My biggest one ever was 18 months, but I... If, as I've aged and paid so much absurd money in taxes that I really strive to get through that one year mark. So if the stock tops and I'm very close to one year, I'm going to hedge. I'm not blowing that out. Tax efficiency is very important. I mean, my mentor, Bill O'Neill, he was an altruist, did not care about money at all. He cared about teaching people and changing the world. I won those things too, but I, I'm not, I, need to, I need to make a few bucks first. So I don't want to pay that extra 20%. How will you typically hedge? Just buy some puts? Um, no, I don't want to pay uh, time value and volatility premium. I want to short calls, short deep in the money calls is ideal. Now, again, if we're going into an earnings report, I want to buy the puts because you could be of catastrophic downside. Right. In a stock that's just going to go sideways or trend down slowly, which they do. I mean, Zoom, Zoom didn't just fall off a cliff. It went right. down over a year and a half. So you just short calls deep in the money. Now okay. you better be long the stock. Okay. This is really dangerous stuff. I mean, I'm not saying short naked calls. Don't, you know, I'm hedging here. Right, right. Um, oh, I had a good question. I just forget what it was. <laughs> uh, in your portfolio right now. So you said your typical starting position is about 10%. Open trade first. Well, in a bull market, okay. in a bear market, I'll probe with a thousand lot or a hundred lot. Or, I mean, I'm just trying to test the market to see if it's going to support my position. Because I was in SMCI multiple times as it was acting really well in the end of the bear, but it kept rolling over. And then Hindenburg put out a short report on it. it you know, the, the it was the last swat by the bear to kill growth, and that was really right at the bottom. Um, what did you ask me? I'm sorry, I, I carried away. Uh, I mean, just position size, you know, usually oh, start around 10%. In a bull. Yeah. In, now we are in, until new highs accelerate to bull market territory, it's still a transitory bear to bull. But the answer is I have enough evidence now that the market's being supporting leaders. I'm opening with 10%. I want to build it to 18% okay. percent within one and a half percent higher. Um, maybe 2%. Now, anything over that, first of all, if you have 20% in a stock and it goes up 100%, just think about your equity here. You get three of those in a year, eliminate your losers. You're having a very good year. You The, the detrimental impact of a gap down when you have in excess of 20% of your money in one stock could be really devastating. I, 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 I can make plenty of money and make big percentage gains with a max position of 18%. Now that's for me. When I was a kid, I was a cowboy and I did much bigger trades in on margin. I'm way past that. I'm in the stay rich business. All right. Um, so th there's my answer. 20% to open in a bull, build it up to 18% within 2% higher. And then Try to you know manage that position around levels of extension into uh, into bull bull extended bull trends. And when do you when do you typically cut it loose? I mean, if it's a loser, the trade goes against you immediately. It goes against <laughs> I mean, immediately. Like I I sell down three percent. I dump thirty three percent of my position. Okay, five percent, another thirty three and seven. No, that's not really true. I used to do that. Now I'm out of everything by five percent, probably. And I, I, I have, I have such larger positions. I don't want to affect the market a lot. Uh, so I'll sell fifteen percent, and then if it goes down, I'll sell another fifteen, and then another fifteen. I, it's like a rheostat. I'm not on off. I'm turn will it up, turn it down. Will you buy back some of those shares if it reclaims certain levels? I will buy back the sale and add. It's a signal that I was wrong and this market is more bullish than I thought. I need to build it up bigger. 
a little bit, 10, 5, 10, 15% more than I sold. And when do you typically add to your winners? Let's say you buy a stock, gaps up on earnings, and then a week later, two weeks later, it finally pulls back you know, to the seven, eight, nine day EMA, 10 day EMA as, they, as moving averages finally catch up. Do you typically add to your position there and wait for another move higher? I will generally only buy pullbacks if I've missed a true market leader, something like a Palo Alto I've missed, VRT I missed. I mean, that's true. I have an 8%, 5% position in Palo Alto, but I didn't get a si- big size. So now it's extended wildly. I don't want to get creamed. I will try to venture in on a pullback, but almost all my buys are into new highs. Or it, again, it depends on the temperature of the general market. If the general market's in a really bullish moment, and I get really bullish, this old man will buy aggressively off of three days tight, two, three weeks tight. I'm just, and I'm not saying I'm going to put 20% of position on, I'll add 2%. I'm buying, depending on how bullish the market is. If, if we're in an irrational exuberance market, I'm going to aggressively pursue these leaders. But if we're in a mundane, tranquil, quiescent market, I might not add at all off of short digest. I won't do it. So that was my next question is seeing the reaction to Netflix and Tesla earnings, which were both pretty good. The market just didn't like it. Is it, is it just profit taking? Um, is it just, like you said, a lot of stocks are, are overextended right now, might need to pull back. Is that telling you that it's, you know, we don't want to press the gas pedal right now? I think what's more disturbing is the ASML report, which is semiconductors, which is the yeah. dominant sector of the whole market. It's the bedrock of everything. And they missed. I'm sorry, the market didn't like the report, which is clobbered semiconductors yesterday and today. Um, The Tesla margins came down. And Netflix missed on, I forgot what it was, but Uh, they missed on, they beat on EPS, missed on revenues. Right. Okay. So if the market does not receive earnings well, we're starting off in kind of a rough earnings season. Right. Financials, oddly, right. <laughs> are rallying. You know, the XLF gets into gear. I mean, about a week ago, is today Thursday? The Russell came out, or it broke over recent highs, which is finally giving the market some breath. Now, we really, if this is going to be a bull, we need to broaden out, which is wonderful. But all of a sudden, we've got weakness in the number one sector. Now, is it a, I call days like yesterday, and bad days like Gandhi or Mother Teresa days, where Gandhi and Mother Teresa were saints, they were virtuous, they were kind, generous, helpful people. But one day they walked in with 7-Eleven and yelled at the counter person. They lost their cool. They're still virtuous people. They're still great people. Stocks have personalities like humans where they have a bad day. Maybe a giant institution decides to rotate out and they clobber everything in a sector. Right. But it's, it's one day. I'm trying to sit in these things for six months to a year and a half in a perfect scenario. So I'm going to have a a dozen Mother Teresa Gandhi days in my individual names and in the general market. So you've got to be sitting. When you get two, three days like yesterday, and today's not a great day either, um, do you look for new positions to to add to, or do you typically add to existing positions? I think I've, I'm fortified with several names that I think could be true market leaders that I think are going to be model book stocks. And which are, when you say you're talking like 100% upside, right? No, I'm talking like 400. <laughs> okay, good. Stay, I, I, with Celsius and SMCI, I hope you're right. <laughs> no, they both qualify. I mean, th- look, there's a template. Pre-tax margins, after-tax margins, return on equity, sales growth, earnings growth, sector strength, earnings beat, earnings estimates. If they're all over 20%, you are in a, in a template stock that has led the market in prior bull cycles. Again, I'm a simple person. I've identified we're in a transitory bear to bull. I've identified what I think are the leaders. I've missed a couple. If we pull back, I'm going to try and get those one or two that I've missed, right. but I think I'm in the right ones. What are a couple that you missed that you'd love to get into? Palo Alto okay. and VRTX or uh, VRT. Okay. There's a few others, but you know, you're clear. In, and again, I'm not talking about some little stock. 
I'm talking about institutional grade liquidity, 200, 300, a billion dollars of daily dollar volume. If you don't have institutions behind you, it's just, it might work, but why, why not have that in your favor? You can buy anything you want. Now, wh- why do you love the institutional support so much? Because they're, they have so much damn money that they're, and they're in it for a long time and they'll, they'll support the stock on pullbacks. Boom. Both. Once you get an institutional complex to come in, they are say they have five funds or 10 funds. The analyst goes from one office manager. He says, I love XYZ. And you go to the next guy down the hall, tells him. And next thing you know, the whole complex is buying the same stock. <laughs> but also when you get into a bad market like this, I mean, a bad day, or we're going to pull back to the 21 day, almost for sure. So this was, it's no shocker here that we're having a rough day or two. But if you have some illiquid little mine, micro cap and somebody wants to dump a position, there's no buyers. Right. It can you go down 20%. In, in, a, in three days. But when you have institutional sponsorship and someone comes and they're trying to dump a million shares, the institution goes, I'm bid. I'm bid for everything you'll sell. And that precludes these disaster down moves. They're, you know, I'll ask you, I'm going to ask you an obvious question. I'll answer it. But if a stock's going to go from 50 to 500, but the average daily true range is 8% versus one that's going to go from 100 to 200, but it's going to be a smooth ride, I'm never going to be able to get that monster move because I can't sit through the volatility. It's having a stock that's going to go up massively, but the volatility is going to rattle you so hard you can't sit. I'm, I'm trying to make this as easy as possible on myself. And less, as less anxious, as less stressful as possible. You got it. Um, anything we missed over? I mean, I know you uh, recently launched a new service. You want to tell us about that? I Thank you. Uh, I have a, a service called the Ropal Report where I teach people. It's a mentoring service where I do a, I'll answer all your questions every Wednesday. I give market commentary. I, and then on a Sunday, every Sunday, I release a 20 to 50 page report that is my ride the wave plan for the whole week. I go over every market leader that I've identified, the trends of the market, what the dominant fundamental factor of the market is, buy points. I give scalp trades. I have a tech service that blasts out any major news. Um, You can bundle the two together. There's the Wednesday video webinar, and then there's the Sunday report. And uh, for your subscribers only, if you put the cone founder in, you'll get 30% off. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you uh, for having me on. One of the last questions, What are there sectors that you won't trade? I mean, I assume if you're looking for market leaders that can go up 200, 300, 400%, I mean, there's got to be sectors that it just doesn't work for, right? Well, part of can slim is L, or I'm sorry, N for new high. And one of the reasons it always works is, look, the gold bar list, if I can only have one, would be the new high list. Because if basic material aggregate stocks are going to go from 30 to 300, they have to make a new high all the way. It's impossible to have a leader not show up in that list. Every monster stock has got to be there. So I don't care if it's gold or aggregate or roofing stocks. Like If you look at the building stocks, heating and HVAC, windows, bricks and mortar, cement, CMEX in Mexico, the reshoring, nearshoring, is a tectonic shift in global commerce. Okay, this is, and all these stocks are like, you know, normally like sleep roofing stocks. Who cares? I care. They're building roofs on all these giant warehouses and factories. Some of these stocks, the performance has just been mind boggling. I mean, even the home builders, like who would have thought home builders would be, you know, ripping this entire year with mortgage rates at 7%. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is price. (laughs) And so many times, I have information that I think is relevant and the market disagrees. If I were to back my opinion against the market, I'm probably going to get steamrolled. Or the information I have may just not be adapted by the market at that moment. It might be six months later, but I can't fight a market for six months for the trend to turn my way. I'll wait for the new high to establish, wow, now the market agrees with my position. In a perfect scenario, I'm making this sound too easy. It's just really, really hard. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's easy. 
Uh, but we do like to make it harder and more stressful on ourselves. You know, Nicholas Darvis did not watch the screen ever. Wow. He put his stops in and walked away, which eliminated our enemy, which is our emotions. Buy your stocks off of a proper base, put a stop in and go to work. Because when you have brutal days and there's violent shakes and your P&L is going all over, you're going to sell. You're going to panic. Yeah, you get emotional. If, if you're out in, you know, selling whatever your job, doing your job, and you're not paying attention, you're not sweating anything. I mean, I'll admit, I mean, before uh, we jumped on, I set my stop losses on some trades today and then shut down interactive brokers at the beginning of the podcast because it doesn't really matter. I mean, I have my stops in. Hopefully, they, they get executed. <laughs> and if they don't, then, you know, great. I'll hold them into tomorrow. Take your emotion out of the situation and you're going to have better results. The problem with investors is investors. <laughs> it's, that's the problem. Um, I think you're super smart for doing that. Well, Jim, this is great. Thank you so much. I hope we can do it again. Uh, congrats on all the success you've had and, and uh, kudos, sir. Thank you for being in Celsius. And SMCI is a relatively new position for me. I've only been in for, for a few months, but Celsius, I've been in a, in a bull, uh, I've been in that one for a while. So uh, glad you're in it as well. That gives me a little bit more confidence. I wish you many more. And thank you for having me. Everybody check out Roper Report and uh, have me on again in a couple of months or whenever you want. Would love to. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Take Talk care. Bye-bye.